the wall in the middle of the book. There's a wall in the middle of the book. And it's a good thing. The wall protects this side of the book from the other side of the book. This side of the book is safe. The other side is not. But the most dangerous thing on the other side of the book is the ogre. If the ogre ever caught me, he'd eat me up. That's why I'm glad there's a wall in the middle of the book and that I'm on this side of it. <laughs> huh? Wait a second. What's going on? This is not supposed to happen on this side of the wall. Wow! Thank you so much! <gasps> oh no! I'm on the other side of the book! And you're the ogre who's going to eat me up! Ha, ha, ha. I'm actually a nice ogre. And this side of the book is fantastic. Come on. I'll show you around. Hey, ogre. Wait for me. The Digger and the Flower by Joseph Kiefler. It was morning and the big trucks were ready to work. Let's hoist, said Crane. Let's push, said Dozer. Let's dig, said Digger. Together, they built tall buildings for working. They 
they built roads for driving. And bridges for crossing. They built and built until the loud whistle blew. I'm beat, said Crane. Me too, said Dozer. The other big trucks took a break, but Digger did not. He had found something in the rubble. Hmm. Hello there, he said. The flower was tiny, but it was beautiful. Every day, while the other big trucks built, Digger visited the flower. He watered it when its leaves looked dry. Drink up. He shielded it on windy days. Just before he switched off for the night, Digger sang the flower a bedtime song. <laughs> the flower grew, but the city grew too. Soon, every space had been filled. Every space but one. We need to put a building here, said Crane. Dozer started his engine. Before Digger could stop him, uh, Dozer blew a big puff of smoke. And cut the flower down. Then the other big trucks went back to work. Oh, but Digger did not. <sighs> when the smoke cleared, Digger saw something in the rubble. <laughs> Little seeds, he said. He scooped them up and drove. Mm, mm, mm. He drove past the tall buildings, past the farthest house on the farthest street. He drove to a place no big truck had ever been. <laughs> there, Digger stopped. He dug uh, 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 and scooped. <laughs> seeds into the warm earth. <laughs> Every day, Digger cared for the seeds. 
He watered them when their leaves looked dry. He shielded them on windy days. And just before he switched off for the night, Digger sang the flowers a bedtime song. Finding Free Fun. Written by Yogi Roth. Illustrated by Roxanne Rainville. Zane loved going on adventures with his dad. After a particularly great day, Zane wondered, Dad, what made today so perfect? His dad smiled. Well, what did we do? We played at the beach, Zane guessed. Hmm, that's true, but we also had free fun. Zane asked, Free fun? What's that? I didn't see free fun anywhere. Well, it's a magical thing. But, Zane's dad paused, I can't tell you where it is. You'll have to find it on your own. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Zane got a determined look in his eyes. Mm. Tomorrow, he would find free fun. The next morning, Zane jumped out of bed. As he got dressed, he wondered if free fun would be short or tall, yellow or green. He started exploring. He looked behind his bookshelf inside his toy chest Could it, oh. and through every drawer. Oh, maybe over. He searched his whole house and couldn't find free fun anywhere. <sighs> hmm, it must be outside. Zane rode his bike all over town. He scanned the neighborhood pool. Free fun? and looked under bushes in the park. How about... He investigated every playground slide. Hello? Free fun was good at hiding. He wondered where else he could look. <gasps> the forest. He zoomed home and begged his dad to go on a hike. They walked deep in the woods explored echoing caves, and climbed up a perilous peak. But Zane was too busy searching to enjoy the view. Free fun was nowhere in sight. As his dad tucked him in that night, Zane sighed. Oh, I can't find free fun anywhere. His dad smiled and said, <laughs> Keep looking, Zane. Zane worried that he might never find free fun. The stars twinkled outside his window as he drifted off to sleep. Huh. 
Zane woke up, buzzing with energy. Aha! He had remembered something his dad once told him. Every answer in life can be found while looking at waves. Of course! Free fun was at the ocean! He grabbed his surfboard and raced to the beach with his dad. <laughs> they paddled away from shore and scanned the horizon. The wind began to blow. The water swelled. Zane spotted the perfect wave. That must be it, he shouted. Free fun is in the barrel of that wave. Zane's dad pushed him forward just as the wave began to crest. He stood up. His excitement turned to fear as he felt the power of the ocean. He panicked and fell backwards under the crashing waves. But underwater, it was calm. Zane opened his eyes. He saw seahorses dance, schools of fish shimmer, and a sea turtle cruise through the brilliant blue water. It felt like time was moving in slow motion. He floated peacefully, taking in the moment. Zane burst to the surface and exclaimed, I found it, Dad! I found free fun! That's awesome, buddy. Where was it? asked his dad. Zane sang out, Free fun isn't in one place. It's everywhere. You just have to slow down to see it. You're exactly right. It's in a quiet moment under the waves. It's in the wind blowing through your hair on a bike ride. And it's in the colors of a beautiful mountain sunset. You just have to pause, take a long, deep breath, and be where your feet are. As they walked home, Zane took in the salty ocean air. Hmm. Listened to the waves crash in the distance. Oh. And felt the sand between his toes. <laughs> Free fun was all around. So Few of Me by Peter H. Reynolds Leo was a busy lad. No matter how hard he worked, there was always more to do. Maybe making a list would help. Leo's list of things to do grew and grew. So few of me and so much to do. If only there were two of me. Just then, there was a knock on the door. Leo opened the door and blinked and rubbed his eyes. It was another him. The new Leo grabbed the list and said, Two of us will get it done. He was helpful, but found even more to do. A third Leo joined the two. How about four? Four makes a fantastic team. But maybe a fifth 
would be even better. Hmm, still not enough. A sixth came in to help organize the lot. After meeting for hours, they decided they needed a seventh. With seven Leos, there was seven times as much work. Leo sighed and said, ah, we'll need eight just to catch our breath. The eight Leos worked furiously. Maybe nine Leos would get it done? Mm, no. Add one more to make ten, each one busier than the next. Leo, 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 and Leo pause to review their list. Back to work! Nine Leo shouted. No time to stop! No time to rest! But Leo himself was exhausted. He slipped away to take a nap. Leo awoke to nine other Leos staring at him. What were you doing? They demanded. I was dreaming, Leo said softly. Dreaming was not on the list, they roared. Leo smiled, still savoring his dream. The Leos disappeared one by one. Leo wondered, what if I did less but did my best? Then one Leo is all I need. Just me. Just one. With time to dream. snow. Over the snow I glide into woods frosted fresh and white. Over the snow, a flash of fur, a red squirrel disappears down a crack. Where did he go? Under the snow, Dad says. Under the snow is a whole secret kingdom where the smallest forest animals stay safe and warm. You're skiing over them now. Over the snow I glide past beech trees rattling leftover leaves and strong, silent pines that stretch to the sky. On a high branch, a great horned owl keeps watch.
under the snow, a tiny shrew dodges columns of ice. It follows a cool tunnel along the moss, out of sight. Look, Dad says. Tracks. Tracks always tell a story. Over the snow, a deer has crossed our path. Deep hoof prints punch through the crust. Up the hill, under a tree. An oval of melted snow tells the story of a good night's sleep. Under the snow, deer mice doze. They huddle up, cuddle up against the cold in a nest of feathers and fur. Over the snow, I climb, digging in my edges so I don't slide back down. Under the snow, voles scratch through slippery tunnels, searching for morsels from summer feasts. Over the snow, I swoosh. Down, down, faster, faster, down, faster, faster. the snow, a snowshoe hare watches from a shelter of spruce. Almost invisible, she smooths her fur, a coat of winter white. Over the snow, I glide. Past reeds where tadpoles play tag in springtime. Under the snow, fat bullfrogs snooze. They dream of sun warmed days back when they had tails. Over the snow, I stand and stare, little mountains in the marsh. Under the snow, beavers gnaw on aspen bark, settled in for supper. Can they hear my tummy rumbling too? Over the snow, stop, a sound. We stand like statues carved in ice, till a bushy-tailed fox steps from a thicket, tips his ear to the ground, listens, listens, listens still, and leaps out onto the snow after an invisible dinner. Paws scratch away to find the mouse he heard scritch, scritch, scratching along underneath, under the snow. Over the snow, I glide. A full moon lights my path to supper. Under the snow, a chipmunk wakes for a meal. Bedroom, kitchen, hallway. <laughs> His house under my feet. Over the snow, I climb one last hill. 
bonfire smoke rises. Warm hands, hot cocoa, hot dogs sizzling on pointed sticks. Under the snow, a black bear snores, still full of October blueberries and trout. Over the snow, the fire crackles and sparks shoot up to the stars. I lick sticky marshmallow from my lips and lean back with heavy eyes. Shadows dance in the flames. Under the snow, a queen bumblebee drowses away December, all alone. She'll rule a new colony in spring. Over the snow, I glide home on tired legs. Clouds whisper down, feathery soft flakes. Under the covers, I snuggle deep and drift into dreams. Of cuddling deer mice and slumbering frogs. Hungry beavers and tunneling voles. Drowsy bears and busy squirrels and the secret kingdom under the snow. the garden and down in the dirt. Up in the garden, I stand and plan. My hands full of seeds and my head full of dreams. Spring sun shines down to melt the sleepy snow. Wind whistles through last year's plants, and mud sucks at my rain boots. It's not quite time, Nana says. Down in the dirt, things need to dry out and warm up. What's down there? I ask. Down in the dirt is a whole busy world of earthworms and insects digging and building and stirring up soil. They're already working down in the dirt. Up in the garden, we snap brittle stalks, scoop rusty armfuls, and wheel away weeds for the chickens. While they squabble and scratch, we spread compost over the soil.
down in the dirt, pill bugs chew through last year's leaves. I give a gentle poke. <laughs> they roll up tight and hide in plated suits of armor, roly poly round. Up in the garden, it's time to plant. I trail a furrow with my finger and sprinkle seeds in a careful row. Give them a drink, Nana says. We pat them down to snuggle in the dark. Dirt, a tomato hornworm rests, waiting for wings, and the leaves where she'll lay her eggs. Up in the garden, carrot plants sprout. Pea blossoms bloom. Wasps are on the prowl, and honeybees visit, legs loaded with pollen. I weed and wilt in sun so strong, even Nana looks for shade. dirt, earthworms tunnel deep. I'm jealous of their cool, damp, dark. Up in the garden, rain shower. Nana turns the hose on me. hide behind the cucumber vines, but their leaves can't save me. I shiver and laugh, drenched in Nana's rain. Down in the dirt, water soaks deep. Roots drink it in, and a long-legged spider Stilt walks over the streams. Up in the garden, there's so much to eat. Ladybugs feast on aphids. Nana crunches green beans. I bite a ripe tomato, warm from the sun. Juice dribbles down my chin. Down in the dirt, a robin's beak finds a cricket, a beetle, a grub. Slugs are scrumptious, too. Up in the garden, we pick cukes and zucchini, harvesting into the dark. Bats swoop through the sunflowers, and I pluck June bugs from the basil until it's time for bed. Down in the dirt, skunks work the night shift. They snuffle and dig and gobble cutworms while I sleep. Up in the garden, a praying mantis wakes to hunt mosquitoes. Nana sprays away the aphids, and I'm after grasshoppers. 
ready to swoosh, but... Snap! Someone else is faster. Down in the dirt, a smooth, shining garter snake crunches on supper. Up in the garden, the wind grows cool. Pumpkins blush orange, and sunflowers bow to September. Nana ties them together to build a house for reading. Down in the dirt, an orb weaver spins her web, strand by silken strand. She'll munch on moths tonight. Up in the garden, colored leaves litter the squash vines. And we know the cold is coming. Hurry, hurry, and harvest. There's enough for the neighbors, too. in the dirt, frantic ants gather what we leave behind. They're storing food for cooler days ahead. Up in the garden, frost draws lace on leftover leaves, where secret egg sacs hang, waiting for the warm to return. We say goodbye and spread the winter blankets. Down in the dirt, beetles burrow, ants scurry home, earthworms curl tight in the dark. When Grandpa calls us in for soup, an autumn moon is rising. Up in the garden, dry corn stalks tremble, and the wind smells like winter. But the long, ripe days of summer still rest in the garden beds. The ladybugs and bumblebees, earthworms and ants are hunkered down, hiding biding their time. Dreaming of sunshine and blossoms and sprouts. Under the bare arms of trees and the blanketing snow, a whole new garden sleeps down in the dirt. children in the neighborhood had lots of toys. Every afternoon, the boy would go to the park, sit under a big tree, and watch the other children play. Sometimes they let the boy play with their toys, sometimes not. This made the boy sad. One day, as the boy was sitting under the big tree in the park, he noticed a stick leaning against the trunk. He had never seen such an unusual stick. 
He picked it up. Suddenly, he was a pirate. Arg! Then a baseball player at bat. And then a knight on a steed. The boy noticed that there were words carved into the stick. He sang them like a song. Imagination lives in you. It's the fire in all you do. Use it well, and you can be anything you want to be. The boy carried the stick everywhere, and anywhere he was, he was anything he wanted to be. At the beach, he was a fisherman. At the lake, he paddled a canoe. He was a hiker in the highlands, and his imagination grew. Time passed, and the boy grew up. With the stick's inspiration, he became everything he wanted to be. He took business trips and airplane rides. He sailed the seas on rising tides. He gave of his time. He gave of his wealth. He gave from his heart. He gave of himself. He built a house high on a hill overlooking the valley where he had grown up. In the distance, he could see the park and the old tree where he used to sit. As the years passed, the boy became an old man. But each day, he took his stick with him to the park and sat on a bench near the tree where he had found the stick so long ago. He would sit for hours and watch the children play. All of the children seemed to have lots of toys to play with, except for one little girl. The little girl always sat under the old tree and watched the other children play with their toys. This made the old man sad. Early one morning, the old man walked to the park, but instead of sitting on the bench, he went over to the tree. He leaned the stick against its trunk, walked to his bench, and waited. Soon, the children arrived at the park with their toys. He waited to see if the little girl would show. He saw her walk slowly toward the tree. She peered down at the unusual stick leaning against its trunk. She picked up the stick, and suddenly, she was a princess. A fencer. Then, a surfer riding a wave. She noticed that there were words carved into the stick, and as she danced away, she sang them like a song. Imagination lives in you. It's the fire in all you do. Use it well, and you can be anything you want to be. And the old man smiled and walked home.
the manic panic. what your household looks like on most days. <gasps> this is what it will look like the day the internet stops working. Oh. <laughs> What's wrong with the Wi-Fi? Mommy will howl. It's down! Daddy will bellow. Good riddance! Nana will smirk. <laughs> it will be kind of funny, I tell you. <laughs> You, on the other hand, will be brimming with ideas and plans for things to do. <laughs> Whee! Which will be of no use. But the Wi-Fi! They will whine. is when you will lose it. You will flare your nostrils, fling your hair, and say what you must. Mm. Mommy! Daddy! Behave! It is not the end of the world. The internet wasn't even around when you were my age. for a million gazillion seconds. <sighs> but that was then. They will finally whimper. <sighs> <sighs> Clearly, you will have to take charge. Do you see the big wide world out there? Waiting to be explored? You will ask. Silence. <laughs> you will dig in your heels, flex your muscles, and stand firm. They will grumble. <laughs> and fret. <sighs> and protest. But you will knit your brows, roll your eyes, and not give in. <laughs> because you know what's good for them. your way back home. <laughs> the Wi-Fi 
I will still be down. But now, they will have other things to think about. <laughs> like the clouds, and the breeze, and the trees. <laughs> A perfect day, you will sigh and go to your room tired and happy. Huh? Hmm? Then you will turn on your computer and freeze. Ah. You'll scream into the quiet night. <laughs> Why is the Wi-Fi still down? You will demand from no one in particular. <laughs> Ask me. I should know. <laughs> An autumn pop-up book. A leaf seems simple, but leaves do many things. A leaf contains green chlorophyll that helps it use sunlight, water, and air to make food for the plant. As days shorten, autumn's brilliance flutters down. With less daylight, Chlorophyll disappears from leaves, and bright colors show. As leaves drop, some birds migrate to warmer places. Hungry critters hide under the layers. Hedgehog curls up in a prickly ball to sleep, its spine sticking out for protection. Wet, matted leaves are homes for frogs, insects, snails, and slugs. Leaves rustle as animals hustle for food. Chipmunks scurry among leaves and stuff their chubby cheeks with seeds. Squirrels bury acorns and nuts under leaves to store for winter feeding. Mushrooms pop up on the forest floor. Mushrooms often grow in damp, leaf-covered locations. Deer eat mushrooms, including some kinds that are poisonous to humans. Leaf 
self-lined burrows are cozy for dozing. In autumn, some animals, such as bears, skunks, chipmunks, mice, frogs, and snakes, prepare for deep winter sleep. Leaves change. They are so amazing. Lion of the Sky, haiku for all seasons. Spring. I am a wind bird, sky skipper, diamond dipper, Dancing on your string. Colorful flowers. We sprout on stems of people. Bloom only in rain. Twigs, sticks, mud, feathers. I'm a closely woven home for cheap chirping chicks. Here's my secret. Soft petals hide inside me. Coming soon, a bloom. I'm a wriggling tube. Soft underground tunneler. I fear early birds. In the still damp air, you sail leaf boats across me. Tiny sidewalk pond. Summer. My fluffy seeds drift. Tiny puffs lift in the breeze. And land who knows where. Wicked wine with wings. That's me, buzzing in your ear. Closer, closer, ouch! I'm towers and moat, molded with hands, cups, buckets. Mighty, till high tide. I love summer fields. Left field, right field, center field. I fly to them all. Fire in our bellies. We flicker flash in twilight. Rich meadow of stars. You gasp as I roar, my mane exploding, sizzling, lion of the sky. Fall. My first day outfit is fresh paint and polished floors. Here come my new friends. I'm a yellow train, carrying thoughts from your brain to the waiting page. I'm red, 
delicious. With a quick twist of your wrist, I'm free from the tree. Reward for raking. A crispy crowd of loud crunch when you jump in me. I perch on the porch. Spooky face frozen in place. Fire burning inside. I search under oaks and gather tasty treasures. Winter is coming. Winter. We are knitted twins, soft as kittens, warm as hugs, waiting to hold hands. I'm cold confetti, falling from a crystal sky, blanketing the town. I'm thin silver blades, spinning circles, carving lines. You and I, we fly. Lie down in whiteness, kick and swish and wave your arms. Give me winter wings. Firelight from the past. I wink in the frozen sky, waiting for wishes. In fur coat and cave, I exhale white clouds of breath. Dream of sun, green, spring. A firefly night. When the moon is high and the stars are bright, Daddy tells me it's a firefly night. I hop off the porch. I feel the air warming my legs and messing my hair. Grass tickles my toes. I zip through the yard, chasing fireflies, gotcha, to put in my jar. Fireflies shimmer. One, two, three, four, five. My jar is like a light bulb that's just come alive. Fireflies glimmer, all of them glow. I race to show Daddy their dancing light show. Flickering quicker, they sparkle and shine. I love catching fireflies, but they are not mine.
I take one gently out of the jar. My hand is a cage for one tiny star. Uncurling my hand, easy and slow. I whisper, goodbye, then I let it go. Soon, many fireflies open their wings. They flitter and flutter, soar over my swings. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, drift through moonlight. Five, four, three, two, one, blink in the night. We walk back to the house. I hold Daddy's hand tight. Will tomorrow, I ask, be a firefly night? On hot summer days, fireflies rest in tall grass or on the leaves of plants and trees. They like to fly around between dusk and midnight when the air is damp and cool. Fireflies range in size from one fifth inch to one inch in length. Although commonly called a firefly or lightning bug, this insect is really a beetle. Fireflies need moist habitats. They are found around swampy and grassy areas, often at the edge of creeks, streams, and ponds. The firefly grows in stages, from egg to larva to adult insect. Some larvae give off light. When that happens, people call them glowworms. Because they live only three to four weeks, most adult fireflies do not eat. A female firefly will lay up to 500 eggs on the underside of leaves, in moss, or in water. Scientists believe fireflies light up in rhythmic patterns to attract mates or to warn one another about dangers. Farmers and gardeners love fireflies because the larvae eat many snails, slugs, and other pests. There are over 2,000 firefly species. The end. Allegro, a magical journey through 11 musical masterpieces. One rainy afternoon, Allegro sat at the old family piano. He was plink, trying to plunk, practice his latest bonk piece. But, slam! 
<sighs> it just wasn't going well. I hate this music, Allegro said. He crumpled it up into a tiny ball and threw it on the floor. There it lay, like a pale dot against the dark wood. But dots are funny things, because if they grow lines, and more lines, and march in lines, they become something that just might transport you to magical places. Away Allegro went, carried off on the sounds of enchanting melodies. He danced with the sailors of wind-tossed ships. fragrant meadows of morning's first light. And he explored the shores of uncharted lands. Melodies were sad and made his heart ache. Some were triumphant and made his heart swell. At times, he wanted to dance a jig. He wanted to march and sing. And at the best of times, he wanted to stand up and shout with joy. I am Allegro! Slowly, slowly, like the dimming light of the setting moon, the music faded. And Allegro was back home. It was still time to practice. So he did. And he did. And he did.
As the season turned, the forest was dressed in new colors of rich amber, burned orange, and chestnut brown. Little Red the Fox was happy because now it would be much easier to hide. A fox would be hard to spy among the dried brown leaves, burgundy bushes, and coppery grasses. Only in the open meadow would Hazel the Dormouse be able to catch sight of Little Red. Little Red and Hazel spent hours and hours playing hide and seek together. The two friends loved jumping and rolling in the crisp dried leaves. They love the rustling sound. The leaves are laughing with us, said Hazel joyfully. During these moments of happiness, the cold air hinted of the coming winter. Little Red felt a tinge of sadness. For Red, the smell of winter meant one thing, loneliness. Soon, Little Red's very best friend in the world would settle down in a warm burrow to hibernate. This season, you will sleep less, said Little Red hopefully, trying to sound cheerful. Little Red, I am no fox. I am a dormouse. I'd like to stay awake and keep you company, but you know, in the end, I must always sleep. So Little Red started to think of ways to keep Hazel from falling asleep. What if I could make the sun stay high? Then winter would not be so cold. Hmm, what if I could ask the forest to hold its fruit? Then there would be food all winter long. <laughs> what if I tickled Hazel to stay awake? Then we could play and play. The Dormouse started to yawn. Ooh. Hazel? I want us to stay together forever, pleaded the friend. Little Red, I promise, when the winter gives way to spring, I will be here for you, and we will play again. I know, Hazel, but before you sleep, May I tell you a story? Why, yes. Oh. As long as it is short, replied Hazel sleepily, with head nodding and eyes closing. So Little Red curled up on the forest floor, and Hazel nestled into the soft, warm tail to listen. But be 
before a word of the story was spoken, the two friends had fallen fast asleep together. diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. For that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. first for another day. Yet knowing how way <sighs> leads on to way. should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. That has made all the difference. <laughs> Flora, a botanical pop-up book. flower begins as a bud. Their blooms produce seeds which root into sprouts.
spring brings rain and warmer weather, which encourages plants to produce flowers. While all flowers share the same humble beginnings, they come in a stunning range of brilliant hues and exceptional shapes. Annual plants have bright, showy blossoms that last a single season. Perennial plants survive many years and tend to have smaller flowers. Many peony and poppy flowers open in sunlight, closing at night and on cloudy days. Jasmine flowers release their fragrance after the sun sets to attract nighttime pollinators. Some flowers have special colors and scents to attract bees for pollination. Bees turn nectar into honey to feed the colony. Many species of bees are endangered due to climate change, habitat loss, disease, and pesticides. Sweet floral nectar feeds tiny animals and insects. In return, they share their dusty gifts of pollen with other plants. Hummingbirds can drink up to two times their body weight in nectar a day. When butterflies land on flowers, pollen is transferred to and from their legs. More than 300 species of fruit depend on bats for pollination. Flowers produce fruits and seeds after pollination. Critters deposit fruit seeds in new areas through their droppings. Some seeds are airy enough to flit in the wind. Others are carefully armored for years. Every fruit starts as a flower, but not every flower produces fruit. While some flowers grow on land, others flourish in water. Aquatic plants nurture wildlife by filtering water, creating oxygen, and providing shelter. Plants that grow in water often have flexible stems that either float freely or reach into the soil below. Life is enriched by flowers in many ways. With purpose and beauty, they help nature survive and thrive. you for always. Do you like letters, little one? 
and envelopes to read, with notes and stamps from places fun, like cities or the sea. Then look up to the sky up high and squint your eyes to see The love note birds are on their way with words to you from me. Their wings are strong, their flight is swift, their plumes a brilliant hue, and nothing stops their airborne gift. My loving words to you. You could be in a towering grove and feeling lost and small. But through the trunks, we'll weave and wove to tell you to stand tall. You could be on a ship at sea where waves are fierce and fast. Swifter still my words will be. You're strong and you'll outlast. Or what about a candy bay where sugar seagulls call? Yes, that's sweet, but I will say, you're sweeter than it all. Or if you're on a mountainside and climbing for the top, I'll cheer you on through every stride. You can, don't ever stop. And what about an inky blue and night comes where you are? Can lovebirds find their way to you? Yes, and give a guiding star. Oh, dearest one, it's hard to tell you everything you'll need. Here, at least, you have my love to read and read and read. Where you go, whate'er you do, have peace, be calm, be still. My love will keep surrounding you. It does. It always will. <laughs> Snowflakes, a pop-up book. Most snowflakes have six sides. Some have 12. Snowflakes and the Snowflake Man. The first person to photograph a snowflake in 1885 at the age of just 19 is also the person who first recognized that no two snowflakes are alike. Wilson A. Bentley, now known as the Snowflake Man, looked at snow crystals through his microscope and was amazed that each revealed a masterpiece of design. Through his photographs, he was able to share these masterpieces with the world.
They look like lace. And fine cut jewels falling. Snowflakes come in all sizes. Most of the snowflakes Bentley saw in his home state of Vermont were tiny, formed by combinations of snow crystals, each created by water vapor, condensing into droplets and freezing on a speck of dust in the atmosphere and growing as more droplets condensed around it. The largest snowflake in recorded history fell in Montana in 1887, measuring 15 inches wide and eight inches thick. They tickle your tongue and land on the snowman's nose. Watch their miracle before they melt. Snowflakes come in all shapes. The shape a snow crystal takes is dependent on the temperature at which it is formed. Some are shaped like columns, some like stars, and some like plates. Snowflakes are very hard for scientists to examine because they melt, and that unique design is then forever lost. The snowflake man was frustrated at his inability to complete drawings of beautiful snow crystals under his microscope before they melted. So he turned to photography. All snowflakes are beautiful. Snowflakes on film. Bentley published more than 5,000 photographs of snowflakes in his lifetime, each demonstrating the complexity, variety, and beauty of the infinite combinations of snow crystals. The snowflake man captured crystals on a black wooden tray as part of his unique process to best reveal the intricate details of each snowflake. Each one is unique, just like you. Snowflakes are all different. The snowflake man demonstrated that no two snowflakes are alike. But why is that true? The reason is that snowflakes are each formed by up to 200 snow crystals, each consisting of hundreds of billions of water molecules randomly scattered throughout and each shaped by the temperature and wind. That process yields an infinite number of shape possibilities, so no two will ever be identical. Shells, a pop-up book of wonder. Shells glimmer in summer sunshine. They inspire curiosity and wonder. A shell found on a beach is the hard outer covering left after an ocean animal dies or moves out. Some beach sand is made of tiny bits of shells. Calcium is the substance that makes most seashells hard. Their varying sizes, shapes and colours delight and intrigue. 
Many shells shimmer and change colours in different light. This is called iridescence. Nautilus shells form in tight walls. Snail shells spiral in many sizes and colours. Beneath the waves, animals are protected by shells. A hermit crab protects its soft body by moving into an empty shell. Some shells blend in with sand, rocks and plants to help the animal hide. Decorator crabs attach live plants or animals to their shells for camouflage. These hard coverings don't always provide safety from predators. Grouper fish have crushing teeth plates for eating shelled animals such as crabs. Powerful jaw muscles help some sea turtles eat clams, crabs and conchs. An octopus has a short, hard beak to crunch on crabs and other shelled animals. Vibrant coral reefs showcase many shells. Reefs are formed as shell-like coverings encase tiny animals called coral polyps. Coral reefs are home to about 25% of the ocean's plant and animal species. Coral reefs are at risk of destruction by climate change, fishing, pollution and other causes. Sometimes a surprise glistens inside. A pearl found inside a giant clam in the Philippines weighed 75 pounds, 34 kilograms. Pearls are made when an oyster forms layers of hard matter over injured tissue or an irritant. Only one in about every 10,000 oysters in the wild contain a pearl. From sandy shore to deep ocean floor, shells fascinate. At the stroke of good night, A dreaming dog A purring cat A bird on a limb A mouse on a mat Run. 
rustle of leaves from the doe and her fawn. A little bear cub bathes in moonlight, and all is quiet at the stroke of good night. A calf in the barn. A sheep in her stall. A colt casts a shadow on the weathered wall. A hen warms her eggs. Rooster waits for first light. And all is quiet at the stroke of good night. But where is baby? With the colt? A plow? There she is. A baby coos. A mommy sighs. Little one tucked in with dreams in her eyes. If you don't have books, what are you waiting for? It's a kid-safe, ad-free library full of storybooks that are brought to life. Ask your grown-up and start exploring more fun stories like these. Seriously, you have to check it out. Thanks for watching. For more stories, try the Books app for free today.